All right, uh, starting the meeting of the Montpelier Rockbury School Board of Directors at 6.31 p.m. Um, just have a couple of quick uh, agenda adjustments. Uh, we are moving the net zero discussion to um, the next meeting just to give the facilities committee a little more time to noodle on language. Uh, and also just adding an action item uh, to the student representatives piece under board business. Uh, we do intend to um, to select uh, two students. And again, thank you to everyone who stepped forward. It's really great to see the interest, um, which will mean a quick executive session to discuss that. Emma? Can we also move, bump the student rep section of the agenda to the top so that the students can then leave and don't have to wait for the whole meeting? Yeah, definitely. We can, we can totally do that. Thank you. Um, so we'll move that to just right after the, the learning focus, if you don't mind waiting just a little bit, Jim. Um, I don't think it'll take very long. Um, so first order of business, public comment. And again, just to reiterate, uh, you know, the purpose of public comment is for the board to listen to, uh, to input from the public. Uh, we are in a listen only mode. That doesn't mean that we're not hearing you. It doesn't mean that we don't have reactions or, or follow up, but we just don't react in real time. Um, and again, the, the input that the public gives the board is extremely important in letting us know the concerns of the community, uh, getting feedback on things that are working, concerns that they have, et cetera. Um, and I also, we just really appreciate the feedback because we know it can be both a time commitment and also um, it's just sometimes hard to come up and, and tell uh, you know, stories that might be sensitive or personal, which oftentimes happens. So um, with that, I'm not seeing anyone in the room. Uh, I think we have Miriam, uh, who's a student. Anyone on uh, Zoom who's interested in public comment? I don't. Nope, okay. Um, Thank you. Moving on to consent agenda, and then we'll hear from the students. The consent agenda does not take very long. So um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Um, any discussion or uh, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> any opposed? Just give a thumbs up. Great. Nice. Um, <laughs> okay, great. So yeah, as right. per our agenda amendment, um, student representatives, and I believe we had three applicants. Emma, do you want to um, give a quick summary? It looks like we have at least um, one of them here. Yeah. So um, yes, we had three really awesome applicants, and I'm super excited to hear from them. And they each submitted a letter of interest. Um, Zach and Merrick have been amazing student reps this year and uh, are graduating and moving on. And um, so there's some big shoes to fill, but it's been really great to have student reps back in the fold. Uh, it was a practice that we had done years ago, but then it had sort of- It, it just died for about two years during COVID. Yeah. So, yeah. so since the pandemic, um, we got it going again with Merrick and Zach and it's been really awesome having you. Um, but since they're leaving, it's time to appoint a couple of more student reps. And um, the intent would be that their term would be for one school year. Um, so we can talk about sort of onboarding in that process with those two students when they're appointed. So I thought we could uh, give time. It looks like Miriam's the only one that was able to show up today. I know that I did hear from um, Anna that she was not able to come. Um, but maybe give Miriam some time to address us. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, or if you want to come up and, um, yeah, just please uh, introduce yourself and happy to, you know, we read your letter, which is fantastic, but um, happy okay. to hear anything else you want to say. Thanks. It's good to be here. Um, my name is Miriam. I'm a freshman, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, here at the high school, I do three sports. I do cross country and Nordic skiing and track, as well as doing being involved with the Earth Group and um, a couple other activities. Um, 
I'm really interested in this position because I have had a passion for the past couple of years for uplifting students' voices, particularly on the issue of climate change with the Vermont Youth Lobby. Um, we organize the Rally for the Planet every year. You've probably heard about it. Um, I think I'm sure you understand because you know, you're know you presenting this position, which is awesome, and I appreciate the opportunity so much. Um, but I think students' voices are incredibly important because we're tomorrow's leaders and also today's leaders. We've been standing up for a lot of things that we care about. Um, particularly here, it is really, I really appreciate seeing um, the board, which impacts our lives and our time at school and what we do here at school so much. I appreciate seeing you guys care about what we have to say. It's great. Um, I also wanted to say, I didn't mention this in my letter very much, but one of the things that interests me the most about this position is the opportunity both to represent students and our perspectives and our needs and ideas, but also to raise awareness and share information um, about the school board to help students get involved and make it more accessible. I've only been here for a little less than a year, um, but other than the track project, which I got involved with because of sports, I, let's say the school board doesn't come up in everyday conversation. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I have no idea why. Um, which, I mean, it makes sense because your procedures are maybe not super accessible to students. But I think it would be great to see more students, like, um, get involved here. And, I mean, it was great to see I mean, I probably wouldn't be here, wouldn't be getting involved if it weren't for this position, and I hope that in this position I could help more students get involved. Thanks. Cool. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Miriam? Great. No, thank you so much. Um, really like appreciate you being here. Oh, I Joe? guess just I wanted to, um, and maybe, and Thanks. thank you, Emma, for all that, all that you have done to to continue to facilitate this and Merrick and Zach as well. Um, and I didn't know if you if you had any questions about like the time commitment because I know that you are very involved in all of these really important things that um, take your time and I just want to make sure that you're comfortable with the commitment of a couple meetings um, a month in the evenings and um, if you had any other questions about, about being on the board. No, I'm definitely comfortable with the time commitment. I um, got some information about that shared in the email. Um, yeah, I, I see this position as really important, and I would be happy to focus on this. Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thanks so much, Miriam. Uh, excited to hear about your work in the Vermont Youth Lobby. I've been following that uh, initiative over the last couple of years. Um, so my question for you is, it sounds like you are really um, dedicated to student voice and clearly see the value in that, and I'm curious what what you might do if you were to be in this position, how you would ensure that you'd be casting kind of a, a broad and wide net to make sure that you could bring as much student perspective to us as possible, you know, students from different backgrounds and interests and demographics and, and just how you would really kind of tap into the student body to uh, get a broad uh, perspective. Yeah, um, I would hope in this position to get more involved in all sorts of things across the school community, um, going to different clubs and sports teams just as a starting point. Um, I also know that the idea of listening sessions, which I know has already a, um, happened this year, and maybe that could be expanded to hear from students. Um, yeah, I don't think I mean, I certainly don't know everyone in this school. It's a small school, but I don't think I know everyone yet. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to hear Merrick and Zach's ideas um, because I don't know a ton about the school board process, so I would learn. Um, but yeah, I think getting involved across the school community, hearing different groups' ideas, and also 
just trying to cast as wide a net as possible to hear students from different backgrounds. Great, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Great, thanks again. Uh, again, really appreciate the interest of, in terms of kind of our process for choosing. We will, we, this is something we do in executive session, which basically means we make a motion, then we meet privately, so that way we can you know, discuss applicants and it's not, not in the public. Um, and then we'll make a decision and we'll get back to everyone who applied. I'm planning Points. to send an email out tonight, so yeah. I'll, I'll okay. let you know tonight, after, right okay. after the meeting. Thank you. Awesome. And you're welcome to stick around for the rest of the meeting or will it, go um, home or whatever. Will yeah. it be announced after the executive session? Who's been selected? Yes. yes it's Who's just expected? not sure if Orca will still be here yeah. for that. So oh. yes. Oh, so <clears throat> we're not doing the executive session, right? Right okay. now. Yes. We'll do the executive, yeah, the executive session yeah. Yeah. later. Um, and we actually have to make the appointment in open session, but yeah. we have the discussion in the executive session. Great. So yeah, I'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thanks, Mary. Uh, excellent, and again, thanks to everyone who applied. Um, Jim, um, food operations, yeah, the floor is yours. Great, well, thanks for having me. It's been, feels like a long time since I've been to the school board, since the early days of the pandemic um, that I can remember. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to come back uh, and tell everybody just, you know, what we're doing. I try to sort of paint a picture of what what food service in our, our department um, looks like. So I've got a presentation um, that is really just sort of a framework. Um, it, it doesn't contain all the information, but it's there just sort of to keep me, keep me on track here. So we'll, we'll start with that. So the first page here, my name is Jim Birmingham. I'm the food service director. Um, I am I'm also an American Culinary Federation certified executive chef is what the CEC means there. Uh, I have been the food service director for the district um, since the 1819 school year. Yeah, we came in together. Right, so this is my fifth year um, here. Uh, I did one year, um, I worked as in the food service director in the Northfield district um, the last year that Roxbury was a part of that district, <laughs> and so I came, came along with it. Um, and so, yeah, I really I appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, we can hit the next, Libby's hitting the slides for me. We'll just spend one minute on this um, because I, I wanted to share this because this is sort of where my philosophy on management leadership comes from. Um, I very often come back to this list um, just to get to, for prioritization, just to sort of keep me on track when I have questions, or, you know, how do we proceed? Coming, coming back to this idea, um, I find helpful. And so this is a, a book, um, it's maybe a little dated now, 2006 book, Danny Meyer's really famous New York City restaurateur, and he has this concept of enlightened hospitality, which I've embraced and I, I, I really have found has worked for me. Um, the tenets of it, we'll just talk about it really quickly. The, the, the number one thing of enlightened hospitality, from my perspective as the d district director or as, the, as a leader, is to put the staff first. That the employees that I have working for me, the staff that we have in our kitchens, to me are the most important people in our, in our kitchens. And, and without them feeling good about what they're doing, sort of believing in what they're doing, they can't really effectively serve our, the second priorities here, right? Our, our, on our list, it's customer or guests, but in, in our world, it's students, right? And so in order for the staff to stu serve the students, they've got to believe in what they're doing. And then I feel like the rest of these things fall into place. The community aspect of hospitality, you know, working with our suppliers, and ultimately, you know, in a business setting, we would talk about investors in our setting, we talk about the budget uh, and trying to, you know, live with, work within our budget and not exceed what we've been allocated. So. I, I share this just to sort of give a little bit of an idea into a little insight into how um, I approach leadership. And also, I'm going to use this as a framework for the rest of my presentation. We'll sort of go through each one of these as a point. So we can hit the next button here, if you would. I alluded to this already. Um, 
we've all had an experience in the service industry with, uh, with somebody who didn't believe in what they're doing, a disgruntled flight attendant or a, or a, or a waiter or a server who didn't believe in what they're doing. And, and that, it's obvious, right? It really impacts your experience. You can really, you can see it. And so imagine how that translates into the lunchroom. You know, if our, if our staff who are serving our students don't believe in what they're doing, don't believe in what they're serving, it's gonna, be, it's gonna show on their face. The kids are gonna pick up on that and it's gonna, be, it's gonna have a real negative impact on us, right? So for me, putting the staff first, recognizing that they're our, our, greatest, um, our greatest resource, you know, when it comes to ideas, solutions, um, the staff is really the, the number one thing for me. Um, and it's where I put my priorities first. Whenever a question comes up, can we do this, can we do that? The first filter that I use is how does that going to affect the staff? They're the most important people and I really feel obligated to be sort of watching out for them and, and, and keeping them first and foremost in my mind. So again, sort of backstory, sort of philosophy on things. We'll get into some real numbers, I think, and, and real world about it now. So we can hit the next button. <clears throat> so the next few slides, just talk briefly about the different um, positions that we have within the food service department at MRPS. So the first one here is our food service managers. We've got a food service manager, one each uh, at the high school, Union Elementary School, and Main Street Middle School. You see on the slide that that's new from the 1920 school year. So the, historically, all of the food service production, and historically means before the 1718 school year was when that changed. It was the director who was here for one year who started this change. From historically, every single bit of food that was served in a school started its morning at Montpelier High School. Every carton of milk, every can of fruit started at Montpelier High School, got put in a van, and then shipped to each school every day. And then every night, there was an order, what do we need to move the next day? An incredibly inefficient way to do it. Um, and when we were doing all the production at the high school, putting things in a van and moving them around town, we're not making friends with anybody in terms of quality, right? I think that we've got to put quality first. And so, <clears throat> Bless her heart, Heather did a really good job that one year that she was there with this element of it, is that she broke away from that and managed to start having the production happening inside each one of those schools. We now, we have deliveries that go to each school each day, not each day, but you know, on our, on our delivery schedule from our ordinary purveyor. We move some things from the high school, um, but really just to try to get some efficiencies so that we can buy one big case of celery and split it up. You know? So we do that when it works for us, um, but when we can buy our three cases that go, go directly to a school, that is a lot more efficient for us. And so that started in 1718, I came on in 1819, and we had a manager at the high school and then we had a manager, air quotes manager, at the, main, at the middle school and at the elementary school who were only you know, budgeted at less than six hours per day. You know, they were managers in title only, um, you know, not really empowered at all to, to make decisions, not empowered to do their ordering and, and, and sort of own their domain, own their kitchen. Um, and so one of the first things I recognized was that in order to continue on this path of getting away from sort of centralized commissary kitchen and into scratch cooking on site, one of the things we really were going to need was sort of skilled people who believed in what they were doing. We, we needed a, like a manager um, in those schools. And so we expanded those positions, added to the food service budget. Um, the two positions, full-time positions with benefits at Main Street and at Union Elementary School. So that persists to this day. And so those are our three full-time school year long positions that come with benefits. The, the job duties for the managers, um, I'm going to sell it short by trying to talk about it really quickly. You know, but I, you know, they lead the production. They're in charge of production for breakfast and lunch the production, the, the service, the cleanup, they sort of provide the, the, the what's the word? They're in charge, right? They're, they're, they're out to make sure that those things happen. They're coordinating production, service, and cleanup. There's this culture of food safety and sanitation that they're responsible for um, in each one of the kitchens. 
Critically, they're in, uh, responsible for ordering food and supplies, whether that's, again, you know, send me a, a bunch of celery from the high school or send me three cases of cheese hamburgers from our ordinary purveyor. They're doing that um, ordering uh, each day. They are also responsible for cash, the cash register and deposits that come through their cash register, so they're handling money uh, in the kitchens each day. Um, and then a real critical thing that our managers do is they coordinate with other departments. I think the most critical thing that they're doing is coordinating with the nurse's office. Um, you know, that we have students with dietary restrictions and, you know, deadly serious allergies in all of our schools. And so I think a real important piece of their job is communicating with that part of the, you know, that part of the school to make sure we're providing, you know, what we need to for all of those kids. And then there's other elements too, things, you know, to arranging catering events through the front office and things like that. So our, our food service managers are full-time school year positions, right? So we can switch to the next slide now. At the Roxbury Village School, the food service coordinator is different there. So we, we mid, did that, titled that position a little bit differently at Roxbury because they're, the critical element of the cash register and the deposits is not part of that position. Uh, Tina does that for us, uh, you know, handles that element for us at the school. And so that's one piece that's not, not part of that position. Um, and it's also a 5.75 hour a day position. So we're gonna find as we get to the next slide too that most all of our positions in food service are 5.75 hour a day positions. And that's strictly so that our positions come in at less than six hours, um, so that they're less than 30 hours per week, um, so that we don't have to offer them healthcare benefits is really what that comes down to. Um, through you know, the Affordable Care Act, it says that you know, employees who work more than 30 hours a week are entitled to that. Uh, in, entitled to health benefits. Um, and so I don't know if that's when it started, but this is one of the elements that we, where we see that in our, in our budget is that our coordinator and all the food service assistants are budgeted at 5.75 hours per day. The, the Roxbury Village School uh, coordinator um, <clears throat> does a fantastic job. There was really a lot of turnover over the first four years um, that we were operating there. Um, and she's really brought a lot of stability to it and has really been a godsend. Um, the thing that we should recognize about the food service coordinator at Roxbury is that it's solo production. This, you know, this, this employee works by themselves. Um, she puts out breakfast, puts out lunch. We'll talk a little bit in a minute about the other two programs that happen there, the fresh fruit and vegetable program um, and after school snack. So the food service coordinator is very much like a food service manager, except that they're working solo, um, so they don't have a team to manage. Um, and they're not being tasked with handling cash and doing deposits and that sort of stuff. The um, ordering for Roxbury, all of that comes through the high school. We don't ever generate enough, um, a large enough food order at Roxbury to, to warrant the purveyor bringing the truck out there. So all of those supplies are delivered here and then we repackage them and, and ship them out there um, on our own. So the Roxbury Village School is the one food service coordinator that we have. The next slides of our food service assistants. Um, this is one that I definitely sell short by trying to list the, their, what they do in just a few lines on a PowerPoint slide. You know, preparation, product, you know, production, preparation, service, and cleanup of breakfast and lunch um, sort of wraps it up. Um, but definitely there's a lot more that goes into it in terms of knowing those students, recognizes those students, interacting with them, you know, day by day. And I think that that's the, that's like that personal element that they love, you know, the food service assistants. I think that the, the, the staff at that level, they really like that element, getting to know those kids, seeing them day by day. Um, you know, come back to the idea of those, those kids who have special diets and special requirements, getting to know them, recognize them, being able to take care of them quietly and seamlessly, um, you know, really comes down to the, the, the caring and sort of the, 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 the way that these, this staff feels about our students. And, and it's really um, obvious in the way that they talk about them and the way that they treat them in the lunch line, what, you know, high regard they have for our students. So, 
Preparation, service, and cleanup um, in the schools here in town. We're using a point of sale system where kids are entering a PIN number into it. And so we have you know, cashier duties um, as part of what the food service assistants do here in town. Um, and then again, food safety and sanitation would come back to that every time I can. Um, it's the most important thing we do, um, keeping food safe. Um, actually just had a job interview with somebody the other day, and it's a question I ask of every single applicant. What's the most important thing we do to keep food safe? Um, and it, hand washing, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot, hand washing is the most important thing that we do. So food service assistance, um, we have 10 um, positions budgeted at 5.75 hours per day. Um, three of those positions are currently vacant. Um, Tough time of year for us to be looking for help. We've had a few people leave as we've gotten towards the end of the year. Um, all of them, we, at the beginning of 2023, all of our positions were filled. Here we are a few months later, and we've got three positions open. All of them were people who have left citing, they're moving out, you know, looking for places that they can make more money um, and get work more hours. So we've got 10 5.75 hour per day positions in the budget, and we have two four hour per day um, food service assistant positions. Um, they come in 10 to two and help with service. We have one of those that uh, is in the budgeted for Main Street School and another um, at Union Elementary School. So those are they're good positions. I like, it always feels good to know we've got that person coming in. No matter how crazy our morning has felt, it feels good knowing that we've got the, the cavalry coming in at 10 o'clock. Um, we have a handful, that's too many, it's, we have a few food service substitutes um, who, we apply, who we employ uh, sporadically. Um, you know, some of them we you know, come in once every couple of months and then others we use you know, three or four days a week when we're trying to fill in you know, a position that's vacant like we are now. So we do have a few food service assistant substitutes um, that we also employ. So. I'm going to have a sip here. <laughs> Am I going too fast? I feel like I'm going really fast. And I'm apt to go really fast. Okay. Yeah, no, it's good. We'll keep it moving. Okay. So, briefly, I want to talk about this formula that we use meals per labor hour. This is um, a measure that I use uh, to look at how much production we're expecting to come out of the kitchen. You know, how much work are, it's a way to sort of put a number on how much work are we asking somebody to do. So meals per labor hour, the meals are meal equivalents. A lunch counts as one meal. Three breakfasts count as two meals. Uh, and three snacks count as one. Don't worry about that. Just understand that it's a complicated spreadsheet. Meal equivalents. So labor, meal equivalents divided by labor hours gives us our meals per labor hour, right? It's a way that we can measure how much production has happened in a kitchen. The bottom of my slide there shows some different thresholds. That sort of, it's a national standard that I'm looking at here. There's this with conventional service, and that's not using all convenience products, not using disposable serviceware, things like that, which is what we're doing, conventional production. For a kitchen that's serving up to 100 meals today, per day, your meals per labor hour should be someplace between eight and 10. 201 to 250, 12 to 14, so on and so forth. So when we get to the next slide, I think this will make a little bit more sense. So. Meals per labor hour, <clears throat> I'm going to go over and point at this for a minute. Is that okay? Yeah. 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 So, meals per labor hour. So, I figured this when fully staffed. So, this is what we have budgeted for our schools, right? And so, I switched units on you from that slide to this one. We talked about it was this earlier, it was meals per day, and I, I did my average for my spreadsheet on meals per month. I like the big numbers 5,000 meal equivalents per month at Montpelier High School, which means that they're doing 200 and 201 to, or 250 to 300 meals per day, which means they should be in the three to 15 meals per labor hour range. The reality of our budget puts it at nine. Main Street Middle School, we're serving about 3,700 meals per month. It's interesting to see the differences. You know, what the big difference at the high school is that students get a second chance at breakfast. We sell a lot more breakfasts here because of the schedule. And there's a lot of kids, in the, there's a lot of students in the school this year. Uh, at Main Street, 
Breakfast is, doesn't have that second chance. We don't do quite as many, but we're serving 3,700 meals per month. This is an average over the course of the middle of the year, which puts them in that range, should be 12 to 14. They're doing 11 and a half. Roxbury, we're serving about 900 meals per month, which puts the range at eight to 10. Um, and at Roxbury, our meals per labor hour is at eight and a half. So that's right in that range, but on the low end of that range. And then at UES, we've served 4,300 meals per month and our meals per labor hour, while the range, the, sort of the national standard guideline 12 to 14, our range is at 9.5. So can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. At UES and MHS, are we under budget? Well, actually, MSMS too. Are we under budget or over budgeted? What does that mean to say that this we're not This means that we the range? are over budgeted on staff. Okay. This, that we, our staff is, is only doing nine meals per labor hour when to meet the guideline standard, we really should, we really could probably eliminate a staff member and have 13 to 15. Okay. So what this is, what this I used to show um, with this with this slide um, is that we've we've built the resiliency that we need sort of into our program, you know, into our kitchens. We have a handful of substitutes. It's difficult to get them on the short on short notice. Um, it's it's. Um, What's the word? It's it's like it's a lot. It's it, the staffing looks like it's more than it really should be. But then when you think about a kitchen that has five people in it, and each one of them has their six holidays and their two floating holidays that work, well, there there goes five weeks of time right there, and that's before we get into sick days or our two weeks worth of personal days, and in that you know per two two per person. So. I use this um, to demonstrate that I'm not overworking anybody. I don't pull this out and use this with the staff. I don't want to have to say, see, you're not working hard. I can show you with math. Because there's a whole lot more that goes into it than just this. This is an oversimplification of it. And you also have to recognize is that, you know, our numbers, you know, might when everybody's at the high school, we're only going to be at nine meals per labor hour. But if somebody's out at the middle, at the elementary school, we move somebody over. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of that shuffling around. There's, there, it's rare that we go an entire week w without somebody missing work w one way or another. Mm -hmm. And so this is the sort of the math that I use um, to justify the staffing level that we have in each one of our kitchens. There, there diff, there's uh, unique elements of each one of them um, as well. At the high school, we have our sandwich deli bars. So we've got a staff member who makes sandwiches to order during lunch service. And so that's, that's one of the things that you know, skews our numbers some. Um, you know, at the middle school, it's a nice tight little kitchen. It's a, it's a nice compact little space. Um, and it cleans up pretty quickly at the end of the day. Uh, at the elementary school, there's a lot more space and it doesn't clean up quite as quickly. I think one thing to recognize, um, the dish machine at Main Street Middle School, which is a lemon, don't get me wrong, but it's, <laughs> it cycles in about 90 seconds, whereas the one at the elementary school takes two minutes and 15 seconds, which is an eternity when you've got a stack of dishes. So the, the numbers are what they are. I think that th it's, ha it's how I justify the, the budget that we use for staffing. Um, and I think that it demonstrates um, that we're not asking anybody to do anything that's um, unreasonable. Um, and I think that we can see how we've built the resiliency that we need sort of daily um, in order to absorb those student uh, uh, sort of staff absences and such right into the right into our budget, right into our program. Um, so I thought that this was an important thing to share because um, it sort of gets into the sort of the nitty gritty of how do we, how do I really justify what it is that we're doing in the budget? Questions about meals per labor hour? Um, does, does the math that you have up there, does that include the, the three vacancies that you listed? No, that is when we're fully staffed. So th this, this is based on full staff. This is based on full staff. Okay. One thing that I have 
I, I can demonstrate with my spreadsheet, but it would be too, too much here, is that with one person missing, we still don't exceed that range in any one of our schools. So if we've got one person out at the high school, we're still within that 13 to 15. So even when we're down one person, that gets us into that comfortable sort of guideline range. And are the vacancies spread out? among the schools or are they at one school? They are spread with you in a couple of schools. I've got one vacancy at Main Street Middle School and there's two vacancies now at, um, at the elementary school. One of those vacancies I have a substitute filling um, for the most part, you know, four or five days out of the week or so. Okay. Um, and then we are also actually the third person's last day was yesterday. And so we actually just worked it out today how we're going to be able to do a little bit of shuffling from the high school and take advantage of the staff that's still there to fill, to fill in and support the you know, support production where we need to. Um, again, the staff's the most important thing to me and I, and I think that it's important that we're sort of transparent about um, supporting them um, and that they know that when they come up short, if we're gonna find somebody or I'm gonna be there, um, maybe I've sold that short. I spent a lot of time um, in our kitchens um, covering for production. Thank you. So we talked about the staff. So, right, so now the next thing uh, on my list is the students. Um, so the, the next group that we'll provide hospitality to right, is the students. I really like to say that the cafeteria is the largest classroom in all of our schools. It's the one room that everybody visits every day, right? And I think that that's an important thing to recognize um, about, our, about the cafeteria. I love the students who say, what's your favorite part about your day? And they say, lunch, right? <laughs> I like those kids. It's so much fun to be their favorite part of the day. Right? It's like a really cool thing about working in school food is you get to be some, some, a lot of kids' favorite part of the day. So I think that's, that's the, like, the great thing about working in school food for me. This is so much better than cooking for rich people in a hotel, I can tell you that. <laughs> I can imagine, actually. So, we'll hit the button here. So, <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize that there is zero student cafeteria debt in our district right now. Um, when the, <laughs> there's no student debt, in our, no student cafeteria debt right now. Um, you know, in, 19, in, in the 1920 school year, um, when they went to Universal Meals, we stopped sending notices about any negative balances that were there because it just seemed inhumane. Um, and then one year went by, two years went by, three years went by. This year, we got to the beginning of this year and we were able to say, we're just gonna zero out that debt. There's no debt, there's no way for a student to amass debt in the cash, at, the, at the cash register, even if they tried. Um, students can purchase an extra meal, purchase an extra item um, with money that they already have loaded onto an account. And students that are on free or reduced meals, they're able to access to get an extra milk or an extra fruit. If they don't have money on their accounts, which we don't expect that they will, at each of our schools there's a principal's account um, or, a, or a partners in education account that we can tap into at the, at the point of sale. So when a kid comes up or a student comes up who has a milk and doesn't actually have money to pay for it on their, on their account, that's a free or reduced meal student, we can charge that to a partners in education account or, or a principal's account here, just so we can make sure that there's no cafeteria debt anywhere in our schools. It's, an, it's sort of an important thing for me. It was the absolute worst part of school food, um, was telling people that they owed us money. Um, and so I really feel good about that. Um, and that we've gotten to that and we're gonna stay there, that the way we have structured our um, charging policy is such that we're not going to create student debt, but we're at the same time, we created um, a mechanism for students who might not have those opportunities to be able to tap into those same things with the, the partners in education accounts at Union and Main Street and a principal's account here and at Roxbury as well. So the programs that we serve uh, meals and or food through here are listed on my slide. The National School Breakfast Program, 
the National School Lunch Program, the Fresh Fruits and Vegetable Program, and After School Snack. After School Snack uh, happens at the Roxbury Village School um, in conjunction with the CVSU Bridges Program that administrates the After School Program there. The universal free meals we'll talk about here in a minute do not apply to after school meals. Those are charged the way they always were. And so for the after school meals, I claim um, for federal reimbursement the, the free and reduced price meals, and then we bill uh, CVSU bridges for the value, for the, for the balance of the paid and, and the reduced price meals that still need to be covered. So that comes out of their um, contract. Just for information, it's $1.04 per snack, $1.04 that we get per snack. The next line up from the bottom there, but no, we're gonna stick on oh, that one. Sorry. The next line up from the bottom is the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. This is a program that, again, we're running at the Roxbury Village School. Um, it was a program that ran there for years um, until the 1920 school year when everything sort of fell apart. And we have not done Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program there until this year. Fresh Fruits and Vegetable Program, it gives us the opportunity to get Re get a reimbursement through reimbursements serve fresh fruit and vegetable snacks um, to students in their classroom outside of mealtime hours it's got to come with some some uh, educational component as well so the fresh fruit and vegetable program we could do a whole hour presentation just on that it is available for schools that have a free and reduced percentage of 40 percent or greater they gave away all the money to all the 40% or greater schools that had money left over, and so they opened it up to schools that had 30% or greater free or reduced percentages, which, which got Roxbury into the pool. Um, so, so we actually just started that in March. We've only just gotten that back up and running, and it's been, really been a great thing. You know, it gives kids the opportunity to interact with fresh fruits and vegetables, um, and for on our end, um, we get to basically just claim direct reimbursement. If we spend $40 on berries, we claim that $40 back. So it's a direct reimbursement program, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. National School Breakfast Program and the National School Lunch Program, you know, we're required to offer in all of our schools every day that we're open. These are the meals that are universally free. You see it on the slide there, we get $2.25 per breakfast and we get $4.33 per lunch. Um, so I think we could just talk a little bit about that and the free meals because I think that's a really interesting thing and it's unique to Vermont. Um, I don't think Vermont's the only state, but there's not many others and I can't, I don't know of any off, off the top of my head. So the state of Vermont, um, has us operating in what they call a provision two base year, which doesn't really mean anything to you. But what's important about that is that the state of Vermont is paying for the paid meals and the balance of the reduced price meals. So it's all, you go back years, right? We had free and reduced eligible students. Those meals, that, those meals reimbursements were claimed through the federal government. And then the, the, ba the balance of the reduced price was paid for by the state of Vermont, and then the paid kids just paid for their meals. The state of Vermont found fund balance money for this year, and initially it was not a sustainable source of money. They found it for one time. Um, and what, they're, what, to, what they were gonna do is continue to pay for the reduced price meals, the balance of the reduced price meal value, but now paying for everybody's meal, all of the free meals, oh sorry, all of the paid meals as well. So every student's meal is free. Not every student's meal is being paid for from the same pot of money, um, but every student's meal is free. And I think that that's just, it's a wonderful thing. We'll see in the next couple of slides the impact that that's had on our sales. Um, I just think that it's great. Um, it's like one of the things that we've always wanted and now we've gotten here. And now it, we're, we're, we're signed up for a second year of Universal Meals. Um, you know, it's a hard to unring a bell. Uh, and it kind of feels like we're, there's, there's momentum behind it. Um, it's a few months, a couple of months ago now, I got to testify at Farm to School Day uh, at the State House to the Agriculture and Education Committees. And I could see from both of the, in, in both of those committees, in the House and Senate, all of them, that there's a real taste to continue this. Um, and that the, 
the thing that they that, that there, there was concern about at the the legislative level was that they were ended up they're paying for a lot more meals than they thought they would. There's not nearly as many um, students have been approved for free meals as the state of Vermont hoped. I think that um, you know because meals are meals are universally free, people were not motivated to complete those applications. But I also think that people are making more money, and these things are different in the world now than they were in the 1920 school year when we last really had to do applications. Um, Historically, we would approve 120 applications, something like that. This year, I've approved about 35. Hmm. Um, but everybody's still getting their free meals. It just means that the state of Vermont, that more of those meals are ending up in the state's pot than in the federal government's pot. And the legislator oh, across the street was expecting something different. And so I find this very interesting. Presently, students can be directly certified for free, or for free meals by... Um, qualifying for uh, three squares or reach up, the SNAP or TANF, you know, they talk about federally, three squares or reach up. A family that has students that qualify for, th for three squares or uh, reach up automatically qualify for free meals. They don't have to fill out an application. It's what they call directly certified. Those programs, um, those, the threshold for those programs is 120% of poverty. Starting July 1st, the state of Vermont has gotten in on a pilot, a federal pilot, where now in the state of Vermont, starting July 1st, Medicaid eligibility is going to become uh, a category that can give students uh, f their free meal eligibility. Medicaid, um, that threshold is 180% of 180% uh, of poverty. So I think that we're going to catch a lot more students in that directly certified net, and I think that's going to keep the, the state house, you know, keep, make it feel more sustainable for the state house. Um, so I just think that that's an interesting element about it, that the, 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 they're being paid for in different places, the, you know, the free, the free meals and the paid meals, that money comes from different places. Um, and so it's been a little, it's been interesting to sort of watch how that happens um, and be part of administrating it. Last year, it was just a meal, and we had a piece of paper, and we kept a tally, um, which was really easy for us. Um, and so we just had to say, we serve this many lunches. But now we have to use our point of sale system where students enter their PIN number because we need to know what their eligibility is, because we need to claim those meals free, reduced, or paid because of where the money's coming from, different, different pots. Jim, can I jump into the free or reduced thing is also huge for Title I and Title II funding. So we need, we need to figure this piece out or the legislature needs to figure this piece out because it could directly impact how much money we receive in Title I because that's how it's, that's how it's calculated is by free and reduced lunch population. So they have to figure that piece out. There are some districts who have lost 60% of their free and reduced lunch population because of the universe, because they don't have to fill out the paperwork. Um, so it's it's significant that a significant challenge that I think is can be overcome. It's just they have to think differently about how they hand out that Title One money. I, I think that looking at the numbers, they feel that this move into the pilot of using Medicaid to directly certify students will have a greater impact mm -hmm. on those numbers than any effort we can to put a push to put the fill out more applications. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I think I, yeah. <laughs> I hadn't heard that yet, so that's great. But that's not a direct, Medicaid eligibility doesn't make you automatically get the free and reduced lunch, or it does, so that you Start, don't have to do the application starting July Starting 1st. July 1st, we're joining so pilot. So it would be a potentially broader swath of people that don't have to necessarily do the paperwork. Sounds like it. At the, the list for the next year will come out on July 20th. I'll generate the direct cert, the direct cert list based on that. And early in August, we'll send notices to every family that's already on the direct cert list that they don't have to fill out applications. So it's, it's part of our timeline with the free and reduced process um, is notifying the directly certified families. Um, that way, they can just disregard the applications entirely and carry on, yeah. <clears throat> so come, I put this under students because I think that it demonstrates um, sort of ha that we're doing a good job and that, and that the students are, are sort of buying into it. So 
It's been weird the last few years, and it's hard to, it's like apples and apples, it's really hard to compare the numbers. 1920 is just sort of out the window, it was just too much to even try to comprehend. So I like to, I go back to that last, you know, air quotes, normal year, uh, the first year that I was here. Our total meal revenue reimbursements that year, you can see 473,000, call it 474,000. We went through 1920, it was really difficult. We got to 2021, and it did not get much easier for us. Um, you might remember at the time, we were sort of sidled with a lot of really inefficient and difficult styles of service and methods of service, and we did not sell many meals. It was a difficult year. Um, and so in the 2021 school year, um, you can see that we only made about $307,000. That was a difficult year for us. Last year, we got back to ordinary service and we got to keep our universal meals. And you see that our revenue from 2021 to 21-22 went up 189%. We almost doubled our revenue. And so, and then, so that's looking at it there colloquially and you know, like looking at our production records and such, we're serving a lot more meals, like 20 to 25% more meals in a day. Where a busy day used to be 180, 185, a busy day is now 200, 225. You know, that's just me thinking about the high school, but we're definitely serving more meals um, and we see that in the numbers as well. Um, month to date, we're at 97% of last year's revenue. So we're, last year we, we really killed it. We, we, we served a lot of meals. We served a lot of meals that got counted by tally. I've always been a little afraid that our numbers were sort of juiced by the fact that we were doing it manually. And not to say that we committed fraud, but it was an inefficient <laughs> system. And so, and another thing about last year is that our revenues last year, I actually put this in the wrong place. Last year they were giving us 447 per meal. The number, actually the numbers were greater last year. This year, uh, the numbers, they're, they're giving us 433 per meal. So we're actually getting less, 3% less per meal, but our total revenue is only down 3%. So that tells me that we're doing well um, with our sales. Our sales are holding steady. Um, and that we're on track to be in a similar place that we were financially this year, uh, uh, last year to this year, when it comes to revenue. I think when we get to the expenses slide, um, we might, our tone might change a little bit. Um, but things are doing well for us at this moment. I feel like we're serving a lot of meals and we're continuing to serve um, a lot of meals. And we're seeing that in our, in our revenues, we're seeing that in the number of meals that we're serving. Um, yeah, so we'll hit that. So we've, well, I guess questions about that? Questions about sales? I was thrilled that you covered this. That was, a, I had a whole lot of questions about how the last couple years have gone, if you've sold more. Sorry, Jim, I didn't ask to be here. No, no, go for it. Um, I know my kid now gets breakfast and lunch and loves that she can get breakfast at like nine between classes or whatever. So um, I also wondered in the context of staff, like how that impacts staffing or it maybe it didn't because it sounds like you still have to run the POS and you've got to still like sort of manage what's going out. I didn't know if it changed staffing or allocation of staff because the payments at the POS are not that was the most significant difference is that we now have to have somebody manning the, re manning the register and, and doing it for real where we could fudge the tally sheet a little bit um, in terms of how, how we did that. Um, and so that's been a big change for us. And we, and, not, and we didn't use a point of sale system at all. You know, from when we shut down in 2020 until the first day of school this year, we didn't use our point of sale systems at all. Okay. So it was a whole new thing. Um, we went through a good, we actually started with a new system and got a bunch of good training with them at the beginning of the year. And it's been a good seamless process for us of getting that rolling. Um, and our reporting has really gone pretty well. So it, it, it has been great. And the universal meals thing, I feel like is having the intended effect of more kids are eating meals. Thank yeah. you. Um, on, the on the previous slide, there was something at the bottom about student feedback. Could you say a little bit oh, more so, about that? Oh, so, you know, we, it's probably one of the things that we can do better, but I thought that when we talk a little bit about how we sort of think about the, our menus, 
um, where, where, the, where the, that feedback comes from. And so the, the biggest thing that we do um, is look at our sales, look at production, and we can see what's a big day, what's a, what's, a, what's, a, what's a less popular day. Breakfast for lunch, lots of meals. Ch barbecue chicken sandwich, and yeah, not so much. Um, and so, you know, the people vote with their pocketbooks, right? And so that, that's a big way, I think, that we do, you know, think about catering our menus from one day to the other, so from one month to the next, is sort of how do the students react to these. Um, we also, you know, are interacting with students in the cafeterias daily, you know, and just like seeing the looks on their faces is a big part of student feedback and items too. Um, I occasionally um, am asked to meet with students. Students have questions or students want to know if we can do this or want to know why we do that, and I'm happy to do that. Um, and actually, the, one of those recent meetings, as far as I know, has is, is led to a survey. Um, so there's a survey that's starting, that is, that's being run, sort of administrated by a student group at the middle school. Um, so that's another way that we're doing that. Um, so yeah, it's one of the things that we, that we work towards to try to cater what we're doing, you know, to, to match what it is that the students are going to be looking for. Um, and balancing that with what meets our standards and what, you know, what works for us. In, economically as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So just to, you know, I'm going through this framework from Enlightened Hospitality. We've talked about the staff. Now we've talked about the students. The next piece, I think, is the community. And, you know, sending kids home well-fed from school, I think, is probably is a as big a thing that we could do for her community as any. Uh, and I feel that sort of put, having a program that our students take advantage of, and we're, our, our, our participation is right around 50% district-wide, which is a lot, um, which, is, which is solid. Um, and so I think that that, for me, is like the big thing, you know, having, having a program that the community can be proud of, you know, food service program the community can feel proud of, you know, being the part of the day that the kids look forward to. Um, I think that for me, that's a big community piece. Um, but then I also recognize, um, you know, that we've got these four kitchens that we're operating, that we maintain in all of our schools, and that in many ways, those are community resources um, that we administrate how they're used. Um, but it's certainly one of those things that we, you know, help out community partners from time to time, whether, that, whether or not that's people in the school community or just in the community at large. Um, so I think that, you know, we have these kitchens, which are definitely um, community resources. Um, I'm really proud of the culture of food safety and sanitation that we have. When you go and look at our numbers, they've historically been in 98s, 99s. We've even had a bunch of 100s um, on our health inspection scores. And so I think I feel really proud of the, the, the sort of the focus on food safety that the staff has in the kitchens day to day. Um, and I also really feel good about the way that we work with other departments, the facilities department especially, um, you know, to keep up with those things and make sure that those physical plant parts of our health inspection um, are up to par as well. I put it here because I think it's an important thing for a lot of people in our community is zero waste. Um, the pandemic was a terrible, terrible time um, for zero waste. And as we have gotten past that, it's become something that we've been able to put more and more effort into. And now when you go through our kitchens, you'll find essentially zero uh, disposable serviceware being used. Whereas a couple of years ago, because of where we were at with, with pandemic and such, um, we were sort of forced into using that. And so that's one of the things that I think is one of the real positive changes that I sense as we're coming out of the pandemic is getting back to that. Some of those things that we were able to focus on historically, like zero waste, um, you know, being a thing that's really important to a lot of folks. Um, and so th and that makes it something that needs to be important to us. Um, and so that's a good example, I think, of one of the things that's really been a positive as we've gotten sort of moving out of the pandemic is that we're able to focus on some of those things that we're, we weren't quite so able to focus on um, when things were so crazy. So we've done the, stu we've done the staff, we've done the students, <clears throat> done the community. So <clears throat> the next one is our suppliers. We're serving a lot more meals. We're buying a lot more food. 
And that's a good way to make good with your purveyors, right? And so that's the way this part falls into place, I think, is that the busier we're doing, the more business we're doing with our purveyors. And so just to show a handful of the, the different places where we get food, the first one here, the Vermont Food Directors Association, we have a contract with Performance Food Group. So as a self-operated SFA, School Food Authority, as a self-operated SFA, in Vermont, we are members of the Food Directors Association. Every self-operated SFA in the state is member of the Food Directors Association. We bid our, our grocery bill, our, our contract, all together. So that, in fact, while we're hundreds, dozens and dozens of little contracts and, and little stops for their truck, they talk to us as though we're their largest buyer. And so we are able to buy at their highest tier of purchasing, which means that we get the best prices of, of anybody that you could get from our purveyors because we're members of the Food Directors Association. We've got a couple of people who work as volunteers um, to administrate that group. Um, and every five years, we put the bid, the contract out to bid. Um, last, we're in the second year of the newest bid, of the newest contract with Performance Food Group. Um, and so that's the company that up until a few months ago, they were Reinhardt Food Service, they were purchased now, they're Performance Food Group. So that's the, the, those are the trucks that you'll see pulling up um, to our schools early in the morning on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, so I think it's an important thing for you to understand that we're a member of this large buying group, uh, a statewide buying group, and that gives us um, the ability to purchase um, as though we are a much larger organization um, than we actually are. So that's a big part of where our food comes from. Um, you know, I would say that 90%, more, 95% of our food comes from the Food Directors Association contract. Um, the next thing there is USDA Commodities, um, which happened two ways, Brown Box Foods and DOD Fresh. Um, at the end of each school year, we're allocated money um, based on how many meals we serve. I'm pretty sure it's 28 cents per lunch. At the end of the school year, they say, you get 28 cents per lunch, which last year I think worked out to about $38,000. And so we got a $38,000 fund uh, sort of USDA funny money, and they have a, uh, a catalog of brown box items that we're able to purchase from. Um, frozen strawberry cups, ground beef, chi diced chicken, chicken strips. Um, it's a long list. I shouldn't have started because um, it goes on for too long. Um, and actually, I, this last year, I've been part of a statewide USDA Foods Advisory Group where we sort of worked with the state to try to pare down that list to make it easier for us to work with. It's one of the real difficult things of managing school food um, is learning how to administrate those USDA foods. The order for the 2023-24 school year was due on March 5th. So it's, it's, it's a long-term thing that we're doing there. So we have about $28,000 worth of uh, brown box items that we buy. Um, that we sort of allocate through their ordering system. Any of that money that we choose not to allocate towards Brown Box um, goes to DOD Fresh. DOD Fresh is a program administered by the Department of Defense, which I don't quite understand, which moves fresh fruits and vegetables around the program around the country. That's a program which locally is administered by um, Upper Valley Produce at a White River Junction. And so that's one, that's a company that has a, a contract with DOD Fresh to administrate that program. Um, and so we're able to use some of our USDA commodity money to bring in some um, fresh fruits and vegetables through DOD. But we do usually put most of our commodity money into the brown box um, items because those are the center of the plate items. Those are the items that have the biggest impact on us financially. A little there about local producers. Um, it's one of the things that we work at and definitely am working to increase um, is buying uh, fr directly from local producers. So a couple of ways that we do that and work within the, pr the, the procurement regulations. Um, we have our informal bid process that we do. Um, informal only because it's less than $25,000 total value of the bid, which just means that we get to pick who we ask for solicitations from as opposed to having to put it out there to the public. So a couple of examples of the informal bids, we get our uh, maple syrup, 
uh, from Templeton Farm, just up the uptown hill in East Montpelier. Um, so we get our maple syrups from them. We but we did that through a um, through an informal bid process, um, and then we also just signed a contract for it's, I think it's a thousand pounds worth of ground beef that we're going to buy throughout the school year from the Gaylord Farm in Waitsfield. So this is a way that we use the procurement regulations to try to keep some of this federal money locally. Um, and then micro purchases is another thing that we do. I think the best micro purchase example I can think of, well, I guess Dog River Farm is one of the places we do that from. And then we like to buy um, rolls and some sliced bread from the Maggie's also. Um, so that's, that's some of the examples of the local producers that we work with. Um, cost of goods. Cost of goods, it's, it's no surprise, right? Cost of goods has increased dramatically uh, since 2020. I put the range there of 20 to 40%. I bet we could find some things that haven't increased 20%, but I came up with 40% when I did the math on milk. We serve a lot of milk. Five years ago, a, a, carton, a crate of 50 milks was like $9.72, and now they're like $14.50. Right? So the cost of goods is real, um, and the, the increase has been a challenge for us, and we, and we definitely see that in the, our, our expenses. I wrote there, we won't talk about it too much, but the supply chain has been an inconsistent thing. It's been a difficult thing. It's gotten a lot easier this year, um, but it's been one of the real challenges of the pandemic. All right, so we did the staff, the students, the community, our suppliers, and now the budget. The, the short story is that the reimbursements that we get do not cover the expenses that we incur to operate these programs. <clears throat> it's sort of just the way it is, I'm afraid, that, like I say, we get $4.33 per meal. Um, you know, we could use Roxbury as an example. If you do think about, it, if we serve 30 lunches there, you know, we're talking about less than $130 worth of lunch revenue that we've brought in. More than half of that is gone to salary right away before we buy one speck of food. Um, and so I think it just goes to show that as, as we sort of move through the pandemic and move through the great resignation and seen the impact that that's had on hiring and on wages and, and what, what it's taken to compete with in wages and that we see you know, the increase in the cost of goods, um, that expenses are gonna continue and the reimbursements are, are not going to cover them. And so, that's no surprise to you on the school board, each of the last two years, and it's possible the same amount was for in 1920, I can't remember exactly, but we budgeted $110,000 each of the last two years um, as a subsidy for school food, uh, so to, to make, make, up, make us whole um, so that we can pay our bills. Um, in the 2021-22 school year, there was $110,000 budgeted, we only needed about 7,000 of those dollars um, in, order to make, in order to make us whole. I think that that's an anomaly. Um, last year, we went through, we had an, an interesting thing where we were short two managers through the entirety of last year. Went through the entirety of last year with no manager at Main Street Middle School, and the uh, manager at Montpelier High School was out on a long-term medical all last year. And so I think that that $7,000 that $7, subsidy is a bit of an anomaly. Um, our revenues are, are holding steady. Um, our costs are in line. Um, I heard from Christina just yesterday that when she went and looked at our numbers for the year, she saw that our expenses um, were sort of in line with where they should be with the budget and that it appeared that we were not going to be, not going to exceed the $110,000 that's budgeted for a subsidy. And it appears that that's an appropriate amount of money um, to have budgeted there. And so, that's really how I think about things. Um, I sort of use that as a framework here, so we try to hit on each one of those things. I've, we've left a few minutes here in the agenda. I'm happy to do my best to field questions. Um, so I've heard that one of the best benefits of the free lunches for everyone is to reduce or eliminate the stigma around free and reduced lunch. Um, and you mentioned that it's impossible to accrue debt at the POS. Is there any other way that the free and reduced lunch receivers can be identified or does that completely eliminate the stigma around it? There, how do we say it? How do I say it? 
in the cafeteria, everything that's in the cafeteria can be included in a universal free meal. So that there's never any question in the cafeteria about can I select this and am I going to have to, is there going to be a situation at the register? We offer a la carte items in a, in a vending machine away from the cafeteria so that it, to, to, to try to eliminate that stigma. Um, but I think that the, the systems are set up and, and we go through an important training at the beginning of each year about the importance of the privacy of that. Um, and that there is a non-overt way that students can be identified, that the cashier can read a code that's on the, uh, the screen, that they can identify if a student is appropriate to use that principal's fund for an extra item or, or, or whatnot. Um, but that for the most part, Universal Meals has had that, has had that intended effect, is that at the, there's no scenes at the register anymore, ever, about you can't have that, you're gonna have to put that back, or any, any, can I buy this? None of that. So okay. it's one of the things that I've actually gotten questions from. Students want, at it, it, the high school level, I think the students want that. They want to be able to buy stuff, find an extra item, or get this or that, you know, something above and beyond at the register. Um, but I always come back to the equitability of that, and that I don't want that in the, ca in the cafeteria. Once we went to Universal Meals, I knew in my heart that we were going to eliminate a la carte sales, because the, the, they, they, they can't go together. If we're going to try to eliminate that stigma and eliminate that overt identification, um, then we're going to have to eliminate a la carte sales. And so we moved all of that to the to the vending machine, sort of removed from the site. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Scott has a question. I don't know if Scott, you're in a position to say it or you want me to read it. It's in the chat. Just read it. I'll go ahead and read it. Um, I can read it. <laughs> Is there a mechanism for families to contribute for paid meals even though the state is covering the cost? I don't think this is the answer to your question. Stu families can put money onto accounts so that their student could use it to buy a second meal or a milk or an extra fruit or something like that, but I don't think that's the question. I think he's getting at more of can, can families contribute to the larger pot yeah. And it sounds like the way to do that is through PI. Right. Yeah. Is through MRPS PI, Partisan Education. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the way that is going to benefit the, the, the students on the ground who need it. Um, I think that a, a donation that goes to the food service is really <laughs> difficult to administrate. Um, and so, yeah, if, if somebody was, was, had, was interested in donating um, that to the partners in education or the principal's funds at any one of the schools, I think that would be a good, the best way that I could think of to contribute. Um, well, you mentioned earlier on that cafeteria staff hours are capped just under the 30 hours re required under the Affordable Care Act to be given health insurance, and I was just wondering how that fits in with the mission of putting food service workers first. <coughs> you know, um, It's, it's just, it's simply a budgetary thing. We could, um, we could decide to give everybody a, a dramatic raise, give everybody um, all the, you know, the benefits. The difficulty is that the reimbursements are never gonna, we'll, we'll never be able to cover that. You know, so we could give all, if we give, we've got 17 employees, if we gave them all a family benefits plan, you know, we're talking about $20,000 per year per, you know, per plan, you're talking about most of our, most of the reimbursements for the year. Um, and so, basically, I want that for everybody. I want more money for everybody. I want health care benefits for everybody. But I also understand that that $110,000 subsidy that the school board is kind enough to, to allocate for us, um, we, need to, we need to be careful with that. And that we could keep piling onto that, and at some point it's just not gonna make sense to operate school food independently anymore, and we'll end up, and we could find a contractor who could do it for us. And I think that that's the, that's the hard part is that we, we, we want and want, and I do, I want that for all my staff, but I also recognize that it's, that it's just not financially sustainable. The, the, the reimbursements um, would never cover it, 
and you know the reimbursement just aren't able to cover it and I don't think that it's fair to the taxpayers of Montpelier to ask for more money than we're already asking for. Mm -hmm. Is that fair enough? Is that yeah, I think that, that, yeah, that definitely answers my question. To kind of have a related, <clears throat> yeah. on a related question, um, so what is the, what is the average um, hourly rate that we're paying food service workers? I don't have the average in my head, or you um, have the, but, the so I'll say stages. that the, the published starting wage for a food service assistant um, is $15.25. I put that right in the ads, so I'm not hiding that any place. Um, is that the question? Oh, and then average, it's tough to say, you know, it's tough to come up with an average. I think if you eliminate, you know, like the, the um, how do we say it? I would say that most of the staff are making in and around $16 an hour mm -hmm. based on their seniority and, and, and increases that they've gotten over the few years. I think like the, the biggest sort of group that we have have been here for five or six years or so. So I'd say that's sort of the range where most of our staff are falling at this time. Okay. We've recently decided to, it, although because we're waiting for ratification to happen of uh, the MRE SSA contract, that the wages of food service workers will be aligned to a certain status in the, MR, in the instructional assistance contract. But I can't give too much information about that yet because it, because we're waiting for ratification to, to happen. It would be a, a significant pay increase. And kind of following up, yeah, you mentioned that a few employees had left essentially seeking either a higher pay or more hours. And, and you might not know the answer to this, but what do you think is the biggest driver of the desire to to move on for more compensation is it the actual compensation or is it benefits for instance if they were getting because benefits can be yeah it's not the benefits be, it's not the benefits. it's not the benefits most all of my staff um you know are getting their health benefits through the state and are really careful about staying within a threshold so that they'll continue to get those benefits and how do they get them through the states you just they, like they're dr dinosaur okay mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> um and is the coverage for, adequate or it's, it's, it's what it they're is. satisfied. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say that the, the, the biggest driver, I think, is probably, if it's not the hourly wage, it's the summer. You know, for some people, having that summer off is great. And for other people, it just doesn't work. And so, for, and the, the two who have left recently, you know, I think that that was part of it, was cited, I found a job that's going to employ me through the summer, and I need to start now. I'm sorry, but I have to go. Mm. That's the springtime in school food. Yeah, it is interesting, though, that we employ a lot of food service employees through the summer with our facilities department, there where are, we have in the past. Yeah. Yes. There's, there's an opportunity there that we can't guarantee for anybody. Right, right. But if someone really wants to, we can find a way. Um, there's a lot of painting that needs to be yeah. <laughs> happening. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different motivations at play. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I first want to say thank you for coming, and um, we've never met before, so I also wanted to say thank you because I believe during the height or the very, very challenging moments of the pandemic, you and Libby were the only two people who came into this building, and it was... That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it was quite a time. <laughs> and it was solely and get to, know each other quite well. <laughs> to get food to our families, and I just think that's a really powerful thing that you prioritize that, so I want to say thank you for thank that. You. Yeah. Um, I also have, my understanding anyway, is that over the last several years, the quality of the food has gone up. Um, at least anecdotally, I know when my, who's my now fifth grader was starting kindergarten, we asked someone, you know, how's, how's the food? And the answer was, mm. And these days, it's, we don't get that same reaction. And my kids are very excited to eat the food. And, to, and it's nice to see the, you know, Vermont grown show up on the, on the menu as well. So we'll thank you for all, the, <laughs> all of those efforts. Thank you. Um, I, I have long been curious about why, it, why our food service is run as an independent enterprise and rather just not as like a department of the district. You know, it, the thing I can't seem to square is- Why are we a We have special fund? education, we have general education. We don't expect any of them to make any money. <laughs> why aren't we just saying, Food is a critical part of school. 
<laughs> just like books and teachers and everything else. You're singing my song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I guess I don't have the answer to that. It's, I've just sort of accepted that that's the way of the world. And mm -hmm. I sort of believe that it's somewhere in the legislation about how the, how the, the budgets and it's such gotta happen. Be. It's yeah. got to be. Yeah, I, we're not unique. That's what I've heard. Yeah. yeah. I just wasn't sure if you could provide any kind of context for As, as I understand it, I, I think that I, I, I feel like I can say that it that we operate as an enterprise fund because we have to, based on the way the state tells us we have to organize our finances. Okay. After school program is in the same enterprise fund. Right, that's true. Vote. Okay. Well, I think we're the only two. Um, but yeah, I really like to talk about that. How come <laughs> the nurse's office doesn't have to charge for Band-Aids? <laughs> no, it's, it's, okay. a, it's a good question. It, it seems like it's tied up in this point that you know, Merrick was raising, and I thank you for asking, because I was going to ask that same question about, you know, I understand it's a real budgetary conundrum that we're not, we don't offer health benefits. The reason we don't is to make sure that our, the budget stays closer to reimbursements than, than it would otherwise be. Um, but if we didn't think of ourselves of having to meet that reimbursement threshold, maybe we would then feel a little less pressure to not, you know, to not that we would go completely crazy with the budget, but I feel a little bit less pressure to, um, to, to be so close to that reimbursement threshold, which then ultimately what it seems like is like the, the food service workers in our district are carrying the brunt of the budget, which feels not great, but. Yeah, no, I understand that yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, it, do, it's, it doesn't feel great. Um, and it's sort of one of these situations where we're you know, asking people to work and ask people to work harder, and ask people to work more to help us without really being able to do much for them. And I think that, you know, it's one of the sort of the tricks to this sort of environment is that, you know, raises are given, you know, based on accrued time, not on merit and things like that, you know, yeah. like, and so I think that, um, you know, it's, it is definitely one of the challenges of um, school food is that it's about the money yeah. and about how that affects people and how they're, how, how, how they work and, you know, how they think about things and, mm -hmm. you know, this idea of, acting your wage, um, you know, is something that we contend with. Um, and, and, I, and you can't blame somebody at the same time um, for standing up for themselves in that same way. So no, I, I, I recognize that um, and I, I do the best I can, um, you know, to create a, a, a work environment of sort of rapport um, and respect um, and to be able to listen to people and recognize the issues that we can and do the best we can to, mm -hmm put people in a situation where they feel good about what they're doing um, so that they can have a you know, genuine smile on their face when they greet those students. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would add on that having worked in a district that did contract food service out, we, we do not want to do that. It, it's much more sterile, it's much I more, it's less yeah. community oriented. You don't have a gym, you know, like a, mm -hmm. <laughs> in your world, you have a, somebody off site from a co large company, um, the food's not as good. You know, like th there's several things like we, we don't want to lose this this thing that we have going on because it's such a better quality thing. I, I hesitated I to even bring it up, but I really feel like that's the thing that I feel like in my job that I'm like out to protect us from, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is to sort of see that that's the, like, we could, we could do that, but this is what's down the road. Um, and so I feel like a responsibility to sort of protect us from that reality. Um, and that comes, that's minding that subsidy. Yeah, no, it'd be good to find out the kind of the genesis and the reason for the way it's structured the way it is, because it does seem like we'd have more flexibility on particularly kind of compensation structures if, if we did it differently. Yeah, you know, I, I like to say we generate more revenue than any other department. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yes. Uh, Seiji. Uh, one last question. I was just wondering what happens to the free and reduced lunch during the summer? Is it still an option for those families? or Our... Not anymore. During the pandemic, there were um, some waivers that were put in place that allowed us to do it. Um, things, there, there was a waiver around non-congregate meals, which we, it meant we were able to give students meals and they could take them home. Whereas now in the summer, summer programs, they have to be eaten on site. Um, that was one element of it. Um, 
we our free and reduced percentages in the in the town in the city are not high enough for us to earn those the seamless summer option grants in order to have those meals paid for. Um, and when we were um, when we were able to do summer meals during the during the those pandemic summers of 2021, did we do it three times? 22, our numbers were were low. We would serve six or eight meals, um, and we started each school year seven thousand dollars in the red. Um, the summer meals um, are available in town. Um, you know whether it's through any of the programs at the churches or through. Uh, the day camp, you know, that happens during the summer at the at the pool. There's universal meals available there, and I think that there's meals available through the rec center. Um, but the bottom line was that summer meals did not make our school food program stronger. Um, they were a drain on it in terms of because it just we didn't sell enough meals to warrant the whole production, and we lost money. I just have a comment and then one more question, which is just back to the hours thing. One of the other things that I was going to one was wondering about was if we're if we're capping people at that 5.7 hours uh, per day, would would we benefit as a like from just operationally of having them there longer? But based on your meals per labor hour. It seems like no, we don't need more labor hours. Right, and the and the trick is we need four people there during service. You know, we don't need four people there all day. Yeah. You know, we need one, two people to get it started and three people to clean up. But it, so it's, if we were saying, well, let's take those, take those hours and divide, you know, take those five positions and turn them into three full-time positions, we wouldn't have enough hands to the, do the register and the service and then uh -huh. the dishes. And so that's the, one of the catch 22s of this is that we need those sets of, we need so many, you know, a, a minimum of four sets of hands yep. in, a, in our kitchens to get service done. Yep. Um, and so it sort of makes it difficult for us because we need a lot of people there during the middle of the day. We can't just consolidate it. Right. It's we, not like manufacturing or, you know, it's, it's about that service time. Yeah, which is a good example of that balance that you need to strike and that we as a board also need to strike between taking care of our people and being budget wise. Right. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Um, so my other question is, what can the board do to help you with your job? <laughs> you know, co continuing to have that subsidy in the in the budget is a, is the biggest thing that I think we can ask for. Is that's going to be what makes us whole, um, really? And and I think that that's where we're going to be able to find the money that we might need to to increase wages or do what we're going to need to do to you know strengthen this program for the future. Um, but I think that that hundred and ten thousand dollars is the thing that we need from you, and it's there. And now it's up to us to work within that. Um, and I think so long as that hundred and ten thousand dollars is enough, then I think that that you're doing what you need to do, and that the rest is on me. Um, yeah, and I really hesitate, like, and I feel really strongly about that because, I, like I said, I really feel like a big part of what I'm doing here is protecting us as an independent SFA. Um, and so that, like, re respecting that subsidy and the, the contributions that the taxpayers are making um, is an important thing. Excellent. Further questions for Jim? Ah, Emma. Um, yeah, I just I also want to echo the, the thanks for you coming and just watching you present about the work that you do for the district. It's clear that you're, you know, very fluent in, in your job and it, it's a thing of beauty just to see like how uh, knowledgeable you are about everything that um, is related to the food service of this district. So thank you. Um, and it's also clear that like some of the questions that I came into tonight that uh, when you're presenting and, and answering our questions, this is only the tip of the iceberg for my understanding of what you do. And so it's, it's clearly super complicated and there's lots of sort of like, if this, then this um, sort of topple effect of, of some of the questions that I had. And um, you know, definitely a, a, at the top of my mind was just sort of making sure that everyone that's employed by you and by the district um, you know, feels valued and supported and whatever we can do to, to help that. Um, 
And then there was like littler things like, oh, you know, I've been to other school cafeterias and there's lots of variety of little snacky items or ice creams and things like that. And your answer was very in line with the, the values of this community around not having a lot of a la carte items. And so I think that could be like an easy question in, in people's minds, maybe students' minds. And then there's this, you know, um, very clear, you know, equity-based reason for, for doing things that way. So I really appreciated that answer. Um, I do think that moving forward, you know, you, you had mentioned that um, some of the costs have, have risen 20 to 40% of things. And so maybe it is time to sort of re-examine that $110,000 and $110,000 uh, in line with the community values. And if there's anything that you would, you know, if we need to increase that line item to support uh, you operating the business side of things in a way that is aligned with the values of the community, I think that that's worth exploring, you know, as a board. Seems like a bridge will cross when we get there. So, I mean, so far we're doing okay. I, I appreciate that. Right, I, right. I won't forget that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if there's some way that we could explore the idea that was brought up around um, maybe the school running, in, you know, having the food service as opposed to the way it's set up now? I really think it's part of statute. I, I think it's out of our hands. Yeah. But, you know, we, we can didn't ask Rosie. Answer, is that Rosie Kruger? Yeah. And, yeah, that's my understanding of it. And really, and it's important to remember that, you know, the whole program is costing us about $610,000 each year, right. and we're putting in one hundred and ten. And so you're talking about a huge increase in what we're, you know, if we're talking about getting out of national school food, school food and take it in-house, you're talking about a huge amount of money. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think that if we can continue to sort of incrementally work the way we're working with what we have, I think that's definitely the place to start. And I appreciate, I appreciate everybody's sort of understanding and, and sort of the sentiment behind everything. Um, and yeah, it's a big part of why I'm in this community doing this. Um, because of this, this sentiment, I think, is an important part of it. I have another quick question. Yeah, go for it. Um, food, food waste, have you, I know that we have a homeless, um, you know, problem in, in our Montpelier. I don't know what's happening in Roxbury as much, but I'm just wondering if you've worked with any community partners to, um, you know, work with our food waste to yeah, help provide meals. That was, that was one of those pandemic challenges. For a long time, um, we had a relationship with uh, Another Way. Mm -hmm. um, and then one thing led to another pandemic, da da da. And they stopped doing that. Um, they don't want, they don't want to do it at all. And so now when we run into that where we have leftovers or we have things that we need to move on, we have a relationship with uh, the community action in, um, in Barrie and the food shelf there. Mm -hmm. I have a, just a relationship as a former colleague with the chef um, there. And so when we have leftover items that are usable that we are looking for an outlet for, um, we're able to take, use, go use Chef Joey in the Community Action Capstone program over there in Barrie, um, and they package stuff up, either, whether they go through the food bank or goes out in Meals on Wheels. But that's something that we do from time to time. Um, a lot of times we're trying to, you know, we try to incorporate our waste back into what we're doing when we make a soup or something onto a salad bar or whatnot. But when we do end up with items that we're sort of stuck with donating or losing, um, a lot of those things, which is rare, we, it doesn't happen very much, but like a snow day before winter break, we ended up with a bunch of extra milk, right? And so a lot of that milk went to Capstone. Gotcha. Um, and so Great. Thank you. Kristen? Yeah, I have two compliments and uh, one boring question. Um, I was at Northfield when you departed and it was devastating as a staff <laughs> person because I had never seen so many staff people consume school lunch before because it was so excellent. Um, so now being a member of the MRPS community and my child goes to uh, Roxbury, uh, we love that you're here. Um, <clears throat> thinking back to what you were originally saying just about the importance and value of staff and that face, you know, across from the students. I just want to give um, some props to Marion out at RVS, who is so loved. Um, her door is covered with love notes and hearts, and she is just like the happy, shining face. She is the first face, typically, that the kids see when they come through the door, and it, it has the ability to change a kid's day, like first foot in the door. So um, <clears throat> we're super grateful for her, so thank you. 
Um, and then my boring question is just um, the federal reimbursement rate, is that set once and at the beginning of the year and or does that fluctuate at all to reflect the increase in price of goods or are you just kind of stuck with it you know, at the outset of the year and it doesn't try to kind of counterbalance some it, of the economic forces? It is set by the federal government um, late in the school year for next school year. So pretty soon we'll find out what next year's reimbursements will be. Um, and then we're stuck with it. Mm -hmm. okay. they, there's some action with the USDA. There was actually just a survey that went around. So they're like actually starting to study about how to study the problem. Um, but it's, 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 it's a long, long way down the road. Um, so, yeah, does that yeah, answer? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it does. Um, and then one other question is just thinking about, you know, woes of staffing that occur. Is there any, is there ever any coordination with um, our career center um, in terms of doing some recruitment out of, you know, they have a really fantastic culinary program. Is there any other work kind of trying to connect with students Chips there and had, get them? Chips had some students in the kitchen. I actually yeah. had an intern spend the entire year with us uh, right. in the 19, uh, 2020, 2021 school year. Uh, yeah, David was a student right. at CV at the Career yeah. Center, um, and he spent his whole year with us, and he bounced around and went from school to school, and the staff would argue over him, no, I want David, <laughs> I want David, um, and it was, it was great. Um, it was sort of a particular thing that sort of worked for David, you know, sure. I think that you, there's not a lot of 16, 17, 18 year olds who sort of see the utility of school food as a, you know, as a future profession. Um, but it's certainly a, an idea uh, and certainly something that we have, have done to some degree with success uh, mm -hmm. in the past. Um, the other people are the enrichment programs that are run here at the high school have significant cooking elements to them that Sam Bromley is into and, and those guys that Jim works closely with and Flex Pathways with one student from Roxbury using the Roxbury Kitchen for his own business now. So it's... it's yeah. Jim's got a lot of connections to the teachers and what they're trying to do. And there's a couple of CBL students who yeah. come and help who come and help out. And you know, I just was thanking somebody this morning who's over at Union. Um, and so we definitely have had that sort of mm -hmm. from time to time. Um, all those things are great um, when you're the manager in the kitchen with 300 meals to serve. You kind of want the right help. Sure. Um, and so that's an element. I mean, that's part of it. it, it it's, it's easy for me as a manager to be like, oh, I got you a volunteer. But that's not the right help. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's, that's part of it. David was the right help, yep. um, you know, our career center student. Um, and, though, and with time, you know, our CBL students get into a routine and they can spend a period and help us out some. Um, but it's not what we need. Yeah. Thanks. Right. I'm not sure if you're... If who uh, has the, the exact answer, but in the 2021-22 year, when only 7% of the 110,000 was used, does that go back to the general fund, one? And two, if there is a reasonable increase, hopefully, we all hope, and somehow food service workers' contracts are tied in with some of our other, other people, does that change the, the 110? Uh, it, we might need to in the next budget year. We're, that's yet, yet to be seen because we have to place people and it's a process we just haven't had time yet to do because it's a very new decision. Um, but uh, that that 7,000, we did decide to keep it in food service, didn't we? There, just yeah, in case. it's in food service. And then once yeah. it's in food service, we're not allowed to move it back into the okay, general yeah. fund. Because so it's, it's there. I think that's come up in budget discussions and I just... Yeah, we kept it there just in case as a safety valve for the food service because we weren't, with the universal free meals, we just weren't sure right. <laughs> what was going to happen and yeah. more normality and all that kind of stuff. Excellent. Well, thanks again. I, I also do want to echo all the thanks and your enthusiasm and um, just the quality you brought to the, the food service has been palpable. And I've, you know, I, I was here here before you came and, and I'm the people there didn't do a great job, but certainly since you've been here, um, the, you know, the quality of food service, all, all my kids are much more much more enthused about school food uh, than they used to be, and uh, that's a you know as you as you stated, that's a big part of students' days, and also their health and nutrition. So we really appreciate all you do and the enthusiasm and, and great work you bring. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Have a good night. So next we are on to board business. We did the student representations. Oh, um, again, we've got the net zero is off. So uh, retreat planning. Um, I can go or you can go. Mm -hmm. I will I start it off yeah. and I think you want, do you want to put some, do you want to put the thing on the board? Yes. I think the biggest thing, yeah, I think as we discussed this, unfortunately I wasn't here, but um, I think Mia kind of led a conversation about um, what we want to achieve with our two retreats. Uh, looks like we've got two dates pegged on the, the calendar, July 14th and August 9th, I believe is the second one, um, for half days. And I know that everyone, and I've, I've been this camp, doesn't necessarily have all their summer things planned. So hopefully those days continue to, to work. And we definitely understand if, if one or two folks uh, has something come up in the summer that um, interferes. Yeah, I think our big uh, goals for the retreats, um, yeah, the first day, I think we really want to get the indicators done. You know, we set out our, our three priority for three themes. We've got kind of the mission um, and, and vision uh, rooted out uh, and really just getting the indicators for those three themes that we want. Uh, and I think a goal that uh, Mia Libby and I have are that we go into that first retreat and reuse the time to get those indicators piled down instead of spending, you know, kind of two hours figuring out what, what an indicator is and how we want to measure it, et cetera. So um, center on some materials and then, uh, you know, Mia's putting on the board kind of, I think, some, some thoughts to, to frame it up. Uh, you know, so I think we really, when we kind of go in for an indicator, there's kind of three main things that we want to think about. The first are the SMARTY goals, and I sent around um, kind of a reminder of what the SMARTY goals are, because I, I get to about A and, and, uh, and forget it, but it's, it's, let's see if I can, strategic, measurable, ambitious, and realistic, which are kind of checks on each other. Like you want to, you want to push the envelope, but not to the point where it's not doable and not realistic. Uh, time bound, so you know, you've got some time frames for these, um, inclusive and equitable. Um, and then we want you know, indicators that are evergreen, uh, just meaning that they uh, are durable, that they're not indicators that are very specific for something you want to just you know, accomplish in the next six months or a year but that a variety of, of, they can be applied to a variety of factors and, um, and do not need to be updated uh, frequently. Uh, and then this is really kind of implicit in the, the SMARTY goals, which in the M, but I think it's worth, worth calling out because we really wanna make sure that there are indicators that we can, can measure progress against. Uh, in a way that's, that's reasonable. And you know, there's, there's generally kind of two ways to do that either something quantitative or uh, you know, something descriptive that's, that's kind of easy to point to. Um, you know, so as we kind of you know, tee up for that first, um, first retreat day, you know, really think about you know, the, the, the three themes, um, which are you know, closing the achievement gap, uh, safety and Belonging communications and, and oh, yeah, safety, belonging, as well as and you know, kind of communications and community engagement, uh, and what indicators would look like that have these, you know, these qualities, uh, you know, and, and we've kind of brainstormed a little around what some of those might be, um, but really give them thought. Uh, the other thing that we might want to consider doing uh, is maybe assigning like a people to, to focus on a particular theme, kind of you know, split up in, in threes, uh, so that way you know, th you know, we've got three people doing a deep dive on each, on each of the three themes, if that makes sense, just so, um, yeah, so, so people have really given thought to one theme instead of you know, 
thought to all, which sometimes means that your thoughts are a little, a little more like scattered and, and you know, maybe uh, not as not as in depth. So um, those are kind of some ideas for the first day. Anything to add, Mia, and then we can open it up. Jim, you're saying um, assign it to people prior to the retreat, exactly. right? Is what you mean? So yeah. You so kind of give some pre-thought to it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, Lynn, Emma, uh, you know, and Seiji could look at closing the achievement gap and, and you know, kind of come in with the idea that they're, they're really given thought to what indicators could mm -hmm. be. Um, you know, UI and, and Kristen could do, uh, you know, community engagement, um, you know, and then Rhett Scott and uh, right. Jill could do, you know, safety, wellness, and being. So I think we, we'd like to hear from you all yeah. like, if that process Make sense if you or have if we're questions missing something. about the process, or if we're missing something, or if you. I, I think another way to think about this is take a time machine at two months into the future, and it's just about July 14th. And if you were to like think about getting yourself into the room with with the rest of us for this retreat, do you feel ready to be yeah. able to name indicators of progress? And if not, what do you feel like you need in order yeah. to be able to do so? Yeah. Yeah, no, and this is the top of the question. I mean, because we don't want to get into the, the retreat and kind of be like, yeah. what's an indicator? Yeah. Is that, is that an indicator or is that a goal? Yeah, so. So we have the three, are we calling them goals or values? Three goals. Priority areas? Priority areas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Libby, could you pull up the other thing I drafted? I think this will help be a helpful visual Thank aid. You which is I took we have a lot of notes from okay. the various different conversations yes. that we've had about this so far and this was my best attempt at putting it all the the where we've landed so far yes. all in one place thank you thank so you here's what we have that. is vision and mission we've named this as our approach um, if you keep scrolling we have listed the values but we haven't done yes. the work to define them yet okay but what we are planning on focusing on, and again, <coughs> you could say, no, actually, I don't think we could do priorities and indicators unless we've defined our values, would be something to just, you know, but what our proposal is that we spend retreat time in this section here where we have these three priority areas, and what we haven't done yet is further defined what we mean by close the academic gaps, what we mean by belonging, safety, and wellness, and that's why those have, like, random letters saying, why do we have gobbled the group yeah, that's why we haven't <laughs> done that yet and then we haven't named what an indicator for each one of those yeah. looks like or what maybe three to five we might land on three to five things that to us indicate we are being successful in these three areas mm -hmm. so this is where we're what we're proposing we spend our time on in retreat half day one Okay. is that and then also we don't have any goals for 2023 to 2025 and again I was just kind of picking that as a time frame because it seems both like enough time for us to get some work done but also not so far ahead that it feels hard to be like set a goal for it so that this is what we would spend our time on in, re in retreat half day one and just to clarify it's, it's a priority and indicators and then the goals would be the second one, or do you do both on the first day? We're hoping to do both on the first first retreat half day because the second one, the is, second half is day our, is the work planning is day. Work plan. okay, is yeah. to say these are the goals we've set for ourselves. What's the work we need to do to get to get to these goals? Okay. That's the hope anyway. So the goals for 2023 to 2025 are different from these um, indicators. Yes and priorities what we're saying the way that i think about this is that the indicators what are evergreen like at any given moment in the future or history of mrps this is something that tells us whether or not we're being successful in this priority area it wouldn't necessarily mean that we're there yet and so we would say to ourselves okay if we're not there yet what is what do we want to do in the next two years to try to get there that would be the goal so What's the like action steps or that's the work plan is for the second day will be more action steps. I think we could consider goals to also be action steps. I think it would. Yeah. Okay. 
and then the work homework prior to the retreat will be potentially to assign a few of us a couple of us to each of the um, priority areas right to start brainstorming language of indicators that's what we're proposing yeah and we want to know from you all if this seems doable if it seems like we will get there well I know I'm thinking kind of aloud here um, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, no, I'll continue in just a second. Um, I mean, I wonder if it makes sense to really focus on those indicators, because I think the, uh, and, and if we're going to also define the priorities too, then I think, I think the goals of the work plan can be the second day, be the second day. And I think, uh, I think a lot of the work plan will be what we want to do, will be kind of those action items, which I think will look kind of like mm -hmm. goals. Jill? Um, I was just going to say that I appreciate this structure and I, I really like it because it will set us up for success and using the time wisely. And I also appreciate the idea of giving us each one priority to focus on because I think I would, I'm pretty overwhelmed with like mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like, so I, I feel like that is a very manageable and realistic ask. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate the structure that you guys have, have built because I think mm -hmm. it, it's, we're not starting out day one. What are we doing? What's a goal? What's an indicator? And then we'd spend the whole morning. So thank you for doing that. And thank you also for making it really easy for us to figure out how to prepare. Mm -hmm. Great. And I think, Jim, what you just said of holding off on the goals until day two will actually make it a little bit clearer in our minds. Like we won't have to be trying to decide if what we're naming is an indicator or a goal. We'll just be like, okay, we're just answering the question. What is it that tells us we're being successful in this priority area? Yeah, yeah and I think on day two, we can be like, okay, what are we gonna do in the next two years to move that ball forward? And there could be, as we're discussing things on day one, we could sort of capture, we don't know what this is called yet, maybe this is a goal or maybe this is a whatever, but like a parking lot, and then we'll be thinking about it, because mm -hmm. a lot of times we might like sleep on our day and the goal might become more clear yeah. <laughs> rather than just, okay, it's 1130 and I'm hungry. And so let's just say <laughs> this or is our Jim goal. Will feed us. Well, that's the irony is, you know, I, I worked for a long time at AOE and free reduced lunch is like a major indicator of academic yeah. achievement. Like it's like the fundamental, like how it's one of the main socioeconomic groups that we measure progress. So as we were talking about that, say as like a light bulb, I'm like, is that impacting how test scores are being reported out or how schools are being measured for success? you know, maybe inadvertently or not, because that bucket of students is not being captured the same way that it was. It's kind of pretty major repercussions of that mm -hmm. that maybe weren't, I, mean, I think it, I'm still incredibly supportive of what's going on. It's just sort of an unintended consequence, but. Yeah. Another good lesson that indicators matter. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I just want to make sure we can't see Scott on the screen and I want to, I don't know if he's got his hand raised or anything. Okay, great. I think one thing that would be really helpful would be um, to know the metrics that are being captured by the de behavior dashboard, or I think that's the name from that Michael. Yes, the panorama that I was thinking yeah. you about yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually by July 14th, that will be yeah. live. Yeah, knowing what, what data, is, data is captured might help us determine what indicators we can really call out and highlight. Agreed. I was just, um, we're communicating <laughs> telepathically. I was thinking that once we kind of have those indicators, it might be nice to have those kind of percolate because so we could think about what sort of other data we need so that we kind of have some baseline, like how are we doing them? We might be doing really great on that, but we might, you know, there may be some gaps to fill and that could kind of inform the goal, you know, a month down the line. So, mm -hmm. so we'll panorama, that will be something that we can access and interface with to possibly pull you, the board will not have access to it. But I have you access all will. to we it. Yeah. Yeah. Request that. yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, got it. Great. Yeah. Um, Scott, and if you want to put something in the chat, have you read it? That's fine. I think I can, I, oh. I can manage for, for now. Really quickly, I'm curious about the, um, the time frame for goals. Um, is there a, a rationale for it being a two year time period and not a one year time period? Um, just seems like, um, yeah, it seems like unless there's a strong um, argument for it being a longer time frame, that one year at a time um, just seems like it would make more sense to me. 
Yeah, again, the, the, the thinking I had there was just, you know, give ourselves enough time to get some work done, but not go too far out in the future. But we certainly could choose one year instead of two years. That was just, yeah. that was. I mean, or we could do both. I mean, there could be, we could give us the option of, you know, there's some things that we feel we can do in a year. There's some things that we feel we want two years for, um, kind of depending on the ambitiousness and the feedback mm -hmm. and, and how realistic we are. But I think, I think if you go much beyond, I mean, I think the, the limit of one year is, is there some things that you might really be able to kind of like see out in the future and want to do, but one year might not be a realistic time frame. I think if you go to three years, then sometimes you're looking a little too far out. One other note on the two years is that that is the time frame for the continuous improvement plan. However, we're yeah. halfway through. So it's not right. like we would be totally aligned if we set 2023 to 2025 goals. We would actually be a little bit, um, we would be alternating. But it is, uh, I mean, it might make sense then to do one year this time and then next time set a, set a two-year timeline so that we can be aligned with the administration and the com continuous yeah. improvement plan. Emma. Um, somewhere along the way, we had talked about um, doing some work as committees to talk about our, the, you know, the, the work that we can do within each committee to help achieving uh, the goals or the indicators. Um, so I'm wondering if it, might, if it might be possible between day one and day two for each committee to have even just like a half an hour meeting um, so that they can be like brainstorming on the indicators and the priorities of what they might want to do for work. Yeah, there's almost I know month. it's during the summer. It's going to be rough. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, would it make sense to have them meet afterwards? I mean, I'm a little, I mean, like, honestly, I'm a little worried about the fact that we have two summer half day retreats because stuff's going to pop up. I think the more we try to put stuff in the summer, the it's, it's just a tough time to do to do work and one to get people to focus and two to actually get people there because we all know. And I would propose like doing it during the day two, but it's we're all on so many committees that yeah. you know, it oh, yeah. doesn't make sense like it, right, too much of a puzzle. But I I think it's possible to do. There's Three to four weeks between the two, I bet we can, I bet we can find the time. And even if not all members of the committee could join yeah. for each of those meetings, you know, if it was really just a half an hour. Anyway, it might be nice to try to make the effort. If we can't do it, we can do it. And we don't have to decide tonight. We yeah. could see where we land at the end of day one and say, oh yeah, this is something that we think would be useful yeah. to do. So let's let's try to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if we can do it. We that'd be great, but. Um, I just, I just know summer is, yeah. summer is tough. Uh, so Seiji asked, said one thing that would be beneficial to have is data from the behavior dashboard. Are there other things that as you think about, I would need to name an indicator of success within academic right. achievement, safety, belonging, wellness, or community engagement that you feel like is information you would benefit from in order to be able to do that? Forgive me if this does exist somewhere, but I would want to know what the administrators or leadership might suggest as indicators under those things. Not to put homework on, but you know, it seems it would be. I would. I would. That would be my first place to try to find out what what we think those indicators could be that would be connected to what to our particular. You know. Yeah. No. I think I think that makes a lot of sense. I also. I mean, and, and at the very least, I think we'd want. At least one administrator. Yeah, one in, the room in particular. To, 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 to say, <laughs> eh, maybe not so much, or maybe you want to do this. Let's um, see if Jason can make it. <laughs> see if Jason can make it. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I, I don't think we would need them. Are you asking for them to join the retreat? No, I just think so. For example, if, if I say, okay, I think between now and July 14th, I would want to dig into the theme of closing the achievement gap because I do think that's. I'd be happy to go wherever, but that my very first question would be, what are some indicators you guys would like us to look at? We may have other ones, we may, but I have to believe that you have some thoughts on that. So I meant like ask ahead of time yep. as yeah. a subcommittee yeah. or whatever. Yeah. 
And we have some. That's what I'm thinking. It might even exist meetings. somewhere already. Bo some board meetings that are coming up. Like that could be a question you could ask at the data presentation that's in mid-June, for example. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Anything that doesn't add more work just takes it from where we've already gotten it or can. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah. You don't have to come up with the kind of everything you need tonight because we've got some time. Um, and on kind of, do people like the idea of one priority? It sounds like we have at least a yes from Jill. Um, do we want to maybe name people at the next meeting, give some people the time to think about what you want? And if not, we can do kind of one, two, three around the room. Uh, It'd be like PE class. Yeah. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we just put a little time on like 10 minutes on the agenda next time to, to um, to, to name those formally, and then it'll give us, you know, a couple months for, for people to think about it. Um, and if people wanted to meet in groups, you could, like, even warn those and just have people, you know, meet for half an hour, hour beforehand and, and do some brainstorming. Um, anything else we want to talk about? And, and we'll, we'll have a couple more discussions before the end of June, a couple more quick discussions, just to make sure that, that we've got, you know, if people have new ideas or whatever. But yeah, I definitely want to make sure, we all want to make sure that we use the time well, because we want to wrap this process up and be able to use it as a, as a tool to guide our work. All right, excellent. Um, yeah, no, and, and Special thanks to Mia for putting those in a very organized Google Docs. Um, My superpowers. Yes, <laughs> no, it's, it's a very important superpower. Good one. Uh, so uh, policy monitoring, um, you have two policy monitoring reports, travel reimbursement and D3, responsible technology use. Uh, do have a motion to approve the two policy monitoring reports, uh, F1 travel reimbursement and D3 our responsible tech use? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Um, and then we need to go to executive session quickly and for the student reps. Uh, do you have a motion to go to executive session for the purpose of discussing the appointment of student representatives to the board? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thanks.